Lo primero, lo, lo acaba de decir Madish, lo primero es que la conferencia va a ser en inglés y que si alguien quiere traducción que se ponga en las filas del fondo, ¿vale? Ahí es donde va a haber la, la traducción. Por otro lado, um, bueno, John Perry Barrow va a hacer la conferencia, pero si hay alguna cosa, hay algún detalle, alguna información que él da y que no se entiende y, o que no se acaba de... hay que profundizar un poco más, se puede interrumpir y... Y, y se acaba de matizar. Luego, bueno, eh, hemos estado pues eso, toda la mañana hablando un poco como de eh, restricciones, legislaciones, normativas que intentan de alguna manera como determinar cuál va a ser nuestro uso de la red y enfrentarse un poco a los usos sociales que de manera emergente van naciendo en la red. Y también hemos hablado de cómo la propia sociedad civil nos autoorganizamos ¿no? y, y creamos... Eh, eh, puentes, grietas o otras formas de entender la red. Y qué mejor manera de hacer un diagnóstico eh, actualizado de lo que desde hace mucho tiempo se viene entendiendo que son las libertades dentro de la red que tener hoy aquí a John Perry Barlow, que como antes anunciaba Gala, hace 15 años ¿no? escribió eh, la, la declaración de independencia del ciberespacio. Eh, poco más, aparte de decir que tenemos a la gente de... Sí, sí, ya lo he dicho. Aparte de decir que la, la gente que ha estado en la mesa de redada, eh, Antonio Delgado, David Bravo, José Luis de Vicente y Isaac Esimov, andan por aquí también y entonces cuando, cuando acabe la, la conferencia de Perry Barro, lo que haremos también será intentar cruzar ¿no? cosas que han salido, que han dicho ellos y cosas que probablemente apunte John Perry Barro ¿no? en este diagnóstico que va a hacer, que como titula la, la charla, son 15 años después de la declaración de independencia del ciberespacio. Eh, John, cuando quieras. Para la gente que no entienda la charla va a ser en inglés, por favor que se sienten atrás, ¿vale? Hay alguien, gente que no vaya a entender el inglés, que por favor vaya atrás, ¿sí? Vale. I am uh, terribly sorry to have to speak to you in English. I have the handicap in many ways of being an American. <laughs> And one of, the, one of the reasons that Americans are as, as stupid about the world as we are is that uh, we don't even hear the sound of, a, of another language besides English until sometimes we're in our teenage years. And after that, it's difficult to learn. Uh, and so I... I, I wish I could speak with you in Spanish. I wish even more that I could speak with you in Catalan, <laughs> which is a wonderful language. Uh, and I hope that, you know, if you can't understand me, uh, that you will stop me and ask for a translation. Feel free to do that, please. Um, because I, I want to be understood if I can. I want very much to thank everybody who has organized this festival, which has been enormously gratifying and encouraging to me, personally. There was a time when I felt like I was one of very few people who realized what was going to happen with copyright. And to see something like the ox cars, where you've got over a thousand people joyously celebrating the fact that they're outlaws in public, was wonderful to me. And, and all of you especially the folks who were on the previous panel, who are down fighting in the trenches of these issues now, are people who make me very proud and I take great encouragement from. I want to start by reading you something that was said to the Occupy New York Uh, people in Zuccotti Park day before yesterday by a fellow named Slavaj 
Zizek, a former Slovenian dissident, speaking to the rally, said, they tell you we are dreamers, but the true dreamers are those who think that things can go on indefinitely the way that they are. We are not dreamers. We are awakening from a dream that is turning into a nightmare. We're not destroying anything. We're watching a system destroy itself. And I think that that is true, but I have felt that that was true most of my rather long life. Because we are in the middle of an historical change that is profound and accelerating now. I will not begin to live long enough to see the fruits of this revolution. You may not either. Because the human race doesn't change as dramatically as it must now in a short time. I'm trying to, what, is there? The problem is that someone with the camera and just with one Oh, I see, okay, all right, <laughs> fine. Um, and let me give you some historical perspective. I mean, one of the good things about being an old guy is that I have been watching this for a long time. And when I was a young boy, it's hard to believe but at that time, everybody in the world, as far as I could tell, believed that there was an undeniable line of authority that headed straight up. And whether it terminated in God, or Chairman Mao, or Marx, it was a great linear column, generally white, with a very powerful and, and infallible being on the top and you on the bottom. And there were a lot of other folks, mostly male, in that column. And their word was as difficult to deny as, as the word that came from the top. And this was even true for beatniks and bohemians and it didn't really make any difference who you were. You believed in that system in the 1950s and early 1960s. And after about 1965, I realized that there were increasing numbers of people who no longer believed that there was such a thing as divine authority, who believed that authority was something that had to be earned and it had to be earned by everybody in the system. What I didn't know then, but I do know now, was that we were seeing the end of monotheism, the gradual decline of that belief system that was vertical, and the beginning of a kind of pantheism which is an authority system that is based on relationship and consensus and mutual understanding. I knew in the beginning that it was likely to be a struggle. There was a moment when I and most of the people in my generation, practically everywhere in the world, thought that it would be over overnight, that there would be a great awakening. I think we all thought that everybody would drop acid and that would make it all good. I think we actually believed that. <laughs> it worked for some of us. Uh, but by 1970, I realized that I was gonna be fighting this all of my life and that even though those large institutions that had seemed so 
functional and credible when I was a boy went on seeming functional and credible in many ways that they were dying and they were coming apart and they would come apart because they were unsustainably centralized and large and as there came to be more and more people who could communicate better and better with one another that the notion that there was some system of authority that could be contained the notion that there was a reality distortion field that you could draw a fence around and and protect the belief system within that fence from all invading forces was no longer going to be true and that the the economic forces that would happen as we became one large global economic unit were going to be enormously divisive and that every single existing power relationship that existed in 1960 was going to be renegotiated over the course of my lifetime. And that moreover, those that had the power would be understandably reluctant to give it up. And even though you knew that they were dying, it, f it has felt much of my life like I was locked in a closet with a large dying reptile that thrashes and spasms and is no less dangerous for the fact that it's already dead. In fact, all the more so. This is the circumstance that you are going to be delivered into and are delivered into. You are the guerrilla forces on behalf of the future. You are the ones who understand, at least in some degree, where we're going and where we can no longer be. You are the ones who are not only waking up, but even more importantly, are not pretending to be asleep. As the Navajo Indians say, it's impossible to awaken someone who's pretending to be asleep. And many are, and it's an understandable reaction to the terrors of the present and the uncertainties of the future. But I detect in you and in others like you that I get a chance to see and try to encourage all over the planet, a willingness to go into that future and even an enthusiasm, a capacity to accelerate into the fog bank, knowing that you can't stay where you are and having a deep sense of the understanding of how different you are from the people who've come before. And I, you know, after the 60s, I personally decided that it was all too confusing for me. And I went back to Wyoming, where I came from, where it was perfectly possible to, pe to spend the 1970s and much of the 1980s in something that was very similar to the 1870s in that part of the world. I was a cattle rancher, and I didn't get out that much. I was writing songs for the Grateful Dead, but I could do that in my spare time, and I didn't have to go where they were to do it. And I tried to, I tried to abstract myself from all of these changes, and I was a conservative Republican rancher. I still felt many of the same things I do now, but I found it convenient to interpret them through a different lens at the time. But then by an odd set of circumstances, in 1985, I discovered the internet. 
a friend of mine, I, I was trying to understand the people who followed the Grateful Dead. Because I, I couldn't really study them very well. As soon as I got around them, their behavior would change. Because as far as they were concerned, I was a godlike being. I knew better, but I needed to be invisible to understand how they, how they made their community. And that mattered to me because I came from a little town of the sort that is dying all over the planet. Little agricultural places that are sustained by family farming are the real communities and they're going away. And I knew that then. And I was looking for new kinds of communities. And somebody said, well, you can find a lot of deadheads on the internet. Now, at that point, there probably weren't more than 200,000 people on the internet. I added up every email address in the world. But, oddly enough, a significant percentage of them were followers of the Grateful Dead. And so, so I got a 300 baud modem, 300 bits per second, and a suction cup that I put on my telephone and figured out how to get connected to this thing, and I didn't even know what it was for sure. When I got there, and it seemed like there was a there to get to, it was a religious experience. Because suddenly I felt like I was seeing the developing nervous system of a whole new organism of thought, a whole new evolutionary layer in the great process that has created human beings. And I have been doing everything I could from that point forward to help that wiring come into being and to make sure that it is open and that it is ecologically sound and that it is not easily influenced or circumvented by all the forces of the past, which naturally regard it as a threat and will do everything in their power to kill it, even though they now need it. But at that point, they didn't even need it. And they were already starting. They, their first initial, their, their initial reaction was to pretend that it didn't exist at all. I mean, for a long time. I mean, for, for, I'll, I'll give you an example. In 1994, I talked to the information managers of all of the American federal agencies, the people who were in charge of information management for the Defense Department, the Agriculture Department, the Interior Department. There were about 30 of them. And at that point, less than half of them even knew the internet existed. In 94, they didn't know that they already had a way to communicate between their agencies without printing it all out and sending it. So they ignored it for quite a while. But I managed to see the leading edge because owing to an odd set of circumstances, in 1989, I found myself affiliated with a group of 13 and 14 year old kids from New York who called themselves the Legion of Doom. The Legion of Doom was trying to create their own internet by hacking into the telephone network. And they had gotten very good at this. They were like cave explorers in the telephone networks. And I would sometimes get phone calls from 10 or 12 kids from different pay phones in New York that would simultaneously land in my ear, none of them paying for the call. And I thought they were great. They were doing what kids do, which is violating the forbidden. And because they were sort of, they were sort of homely and they were sort of math uh, intensive and 
they were still pretty young. They couldn't violate the forbidden they wanted to violate, so they were using the phone networks. And I liked them. And I learned more and more about them. And then one day, I heard that one of them named Acid Freak with a PH uh, had come home and found his 12-year-old sister being held at gunpoint by six or seven large people from the Secret Service, the folks that I thought just protected the president from being assassinated. And, and there in his house were these Secret Service agents holding his 12-year-old sister at gunpoint while they carried everything out of the house that could possibly be thought of as electronic, including his clock radio and his Metallica tapes. And I thought, well, they're coming down awful hard. Maybe these kids are doing worse stuff than I thought. And I, I backed away from them a little bit because I was afraid that maybe they were actually dangerous in some way didn't seem dangerous. And then I got a phone call myself from the FBI. And it was somebody I knew. He was a guy who had investigated some stolen cattle for me. And he was a good guy. And he called me up and he said he needed to talk to me about an urgent matter and couldn't discuss it on the phone. I didn't like the sound of that. So he drove 100 miles north to where I lived and showed up in a very nervous state, anxious, sweating. And I, I had to spend an hour and a half finding out what he thought he was investigating before I could start explaining to him why I was not the person who was doing it. What he was investigating was that somebody had taken some source code from the Macintosh ROM chip and had passed it around to a few people on a floppy disk. Maybe you remember those things. <laughs> and had, Apple had convinced themselves that if this perpetrator who called himself the new Prometheus League were allowed to go on, he would eventually give the whole Macintosh recipe to the Chinese, and that would be the end of Apple. <laughs> Didn't work out quite like that. I mean, the Chinese make all the apples, but <laughs> and eventually we'll be able to do a better job, probably very soon. Um, but at that point, Apple was clueless. And Agent Baxter was completely clueless. And I have never been comfortable with the sight of a well-armed, insecure man going around in a place he doesn't understand. And I knew that just like Agent Baxter, the people from the Secret Service that had been arresting my little friends were, were also clueless and that it was going to be necessary to prove that the Constitution of the United States, which was what I thought was important at the time, actually applied to this new place, which shortly after that I started calling cyberspace, after a Bill Gibson novel that I'd read. And I did some more investigating. I found out about a, a, a game company called Steve Jackson Games that it had all of their computers taken and all of their files because they were supposedly putting out a handbook for computer crime, which was actually a role-playing game called Cyberpunk. Uh, I found out about a kid that was putting out a phone hacking bulletin in Illinois that had been very severely dealt with by the authorities in what was obviously a violation of the First Amendment and the Fourth Amendment. And I wrote about my visit from Agent Baxter 
and about the things that I was starting to see going on on the hacker frontier. And it was read by a fellow named Mitch Kapoor, who was flying in his corporate jet over Wyoming the day that he read it and called me up literally from the sky and said, I also had a visit from the FBI and I'm worried. Can I land in Pinedale and talk to you about it? And we decided that we would get together. We talked. We started the Electronic Frontier Foundation that afternoon. And we, I think we thought at first that it was going to be possible just to get some, some powerful lawyers to take the Secret Service to court and the FBI to court and instruct them on the law in cyberspace. And we hadn't been doing this very long, and we'd been winning since they weren't prepared to see well-funded adversaries. When I realized, in fact, I, I was helped to realize, there was a, a teenage kid in what was still the Soviet Union who crawled underneath the, for, the Finnish border to connect his modem and write me an email saying, that's great that you're defending the Constitution on the internet, but what about us? We don't have a Constitution. And I realized that our Constitution, and in fact every law that could give a human being rights, was going to be a local ordinance in cyberspace. And that we were going to have to come up with ways to defend the borders of this new place from each jurisdiction that tried to invade it, even as we were going to have to make certain that we stayed ahead of them technologically in designing the architecture of the internet because we knew that in this particular environment architecture is politics that what you can do on the internet the openness in the exchange of information coming and going will define what the politics are of that space and there are a great many things that you know, and we were starting to know, that could be done to automatically advantage the net in the way that it was already advantaged. And in fact, had been designed to be in the very beginning. I once had a conversation with a man named Paul Barron. And Paul Barron invented the notion of packet switching, which is the fundamental underlying realization that makes the internet work, rather than mechanically switched networks, which had been the, the way it was done up to that point, all of which were very centralized and vertical and hierarchical. Packet switching made it possible to have this flat structure that we now see. And I asked him, I said, when you invented packet switching, were you trying to come up with a, with a network that couldn't be decapitated by a nuclear attack? Was that, was, what, was that what you were doing? And he said, no. I was trying to come up with a network that didn't have a head and didn't need one. And that was an important realization, and it was something that all of the people, Vince Cerf, David Reed, JCR Licklider, all of the people who it was my great privilege to know, and still know in some cases, they all had that dream in them. They all knew that they were part of a great change in the way in which authority would be conveyed. They all knew, as I know, and I think you know, that it is a fundamental human right to be able to have access 
to all that is known by your fellow human beings. And it is a fundamental right to be able to say whatever is in your heart to as many of them as will listen. So, there is, I think, a right to know. And there is a natural property of thought that it seeks to be known. And there is a natural property to the most basic of human desires, which besides sex and desire not to, not to starve to death, is fundamental, and that is curiosity. And the relationship between ideas and the creations of the human mind and the other people who seek them and who should have access to them was beautifully described, and I'll, I hope you'll permit me. Thomas Jefferson, who was the first patent commissioner, his first public job was that he was head of the, of the United States Patent Commission before he was president. And he wrote this about property and thought. He said, if nature has made any one thing less susceptible than all others of exclusive property, it is the action of the thinking power called an idea which an individual may exclusively possess as long as he keeps it to himself. But the moment it is divulged, it forces itself into the possession of everyone, and the receiver cannot dispossess himself of it. Its peculiar character, too, is that no one possesses the less because every other possesses the whole of it. He who receives an idea from me receives instruction without lessening mine, as he who lights his candle at mine receives light without darkening me. That ideas should spread from one to another over the globe for the moral and mutual instruction of man and the improvement of his condition seems to have been peculiarly and benevolently designed by nature when she made them, like fire, expansible over all space without lessening their density at any point, and like the air in which we breathe, move, and have our physical being, incapable of confinement or exclusive appropriation. Inventions, then, cannot in nature be subject to property. And I think it's very good to remember this every time there is some large institution who claims that they have the right to restrict you from the creative work of your fellow human beings. Now, look. I am not in favor of people not getting paid to do work with their mind. Much of the work that I do and get paid for is done that way. But fortunately, I had the experience of recognizing that ownership of thought was actually an impractical way to get paid for it. The band that I wrote songs for, The Grateful Dead, discovered in the late 60s or early 70s that people were coming into our concerts and taping them. Now at first we thought that they were stealing something from us, and that was certainly what our record company thought. And they wanted us to stop this practice and to kick these kids out. And we did that for a while. 
But then it seemed wrong. They didn't seem like they were doing anything harmful to us. And besides, as the leader of the band, Jerry Garcia said, it's not like we're in it for the money anyway. Which was easy to say because we weren't making any money then. But what happened was we invented viral marketing. We didn't know that. But Warner Brothers didn't have the slightest idea how to market Grateful Dead music. Our records weren't very good. What we really did was improvise live. And we did that very well. We never played the same song twice, in a, in a sense, because it was always changing. So really, if somebody wanted to experience what we were up to, they had to hear those tapes. And when they heard those tapes, they thought, cool, I want to go to the whole damn thing. So we very shortly became the most successful performing group in the United States. We could fill any stadium in America anytime we wanted to because we could haul our audience around with us. They would attend all of the shows of a tour. This was very good for us economically. It turned out that by giving our stuff away, we had made it a great deal more valuable. Not the stuff that we had done, but the stuff we hadn't done yet. What we were in was a service business. What we were actually selling was not a noun, was not content, was not property, but was a relationship between ourselves and our audience that was no different really from a lot of intellectual relationships. Lawyers, you know, which have been the bane of our existence, don't copyright their briefs. Doctors and lawyers and, and, and architects and a great many people don't find it necessary to own the work that they do with their mind because it's protected by the relationship that they have with the people who are interested. And that is the economic principle of the future, which is something that I think you already get. Unfortunately, there are a lot of institutions that have been preying on creative people for a long time and have managed to take the things that human beings have done and now assert 80 years worth of ownership in spite of the fact that they never did a damn thing. But they claim that they're protecting the artists. And protecting the interest of people to want to create art. I don't think that people create art because they think that their grandchildren might get paid for it, maybe. They certainly don't create art so that some large godless institution can go on making money from it for a hundred years. Most of them create art because they want to get laid. <laughs> That's certainly true in the music business. And I think it may be true in the sculpture business and a number of others. Uh, so, you've got a business model that is trying to defend itself, but more to, the, more to the point, you have a whole system of authority and a whole system of organizing things that developed over the 19th century and the 20th century that are trying to defend themselves against the new pantheistic horde of human thought that is coming at them in a horizontal wave. And they find that intellectual property law is the best way to do that. They're wrong. They even know they're wrong. But it's a religious principle to them. And they will fight you in the way that people who are defending their religion will fight. I once 
had a conversation with Kerry Sherman. This is three or four years ago. Kerry Sherman is the head of the Record Industry Association. And he, has, he and his organization have been suing, as you know, people all over the planet <coughs> because they, they want to listen to more music than they can get by, by uh, buying CDs. And the Electronic Frontier Foundation would do these studies and the Berkman Center at Harvard would do studies that proved my basic contention about the Grateful Dead model of intellectual property and said, you know, would prove that there was actually a lot of advantage to be gained in piracy to the people that wanted to create a relationship with the intellectual work. And of course, they would do their own studies and show that they were losing billions. And I was sitting having a drink with him because we got along all right. And I said, how about, how about we do this? You guys and EFF come together and we have a study that asks unloaded questions and we really try to find out what is actually going on. And at first he said, that's a great idea. Let's do that. And they said, no, 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 I can't do that. And I said, why not? And he said, there are people that I work for that would rather go broke than have you be right about this. And I said, so we're talking about religion. And he said, call it what you will. I said, we might as well be arguing about abortion. He said, you said that, I didn't. But we might as well. You are of a different religion than these folks. And they're serious as hell. And they have a right to be. Because their whole way of life is, is wrapped up in this. And the artists that think that they can't make a living making great movies unless they charge for every single one of those movies that somebody sees are wrong, unfortunately. And they've been duped into thinking this. They just have to have a new economic model and they have to be less beholden to the great institution that they're generally working for at this point. There are a lot of things that are gonna be difficult to sort through in this transition. There are gonna be a lot of sacrifices that you will be made to make. You'll be in a lot of trouble. I've been in trouble all my life and it's been fine with me because I know that the most important thing that I can do is to be a good ancestor. And you will make better ancestors than your opponents, I promise you. Thank you. Do we, uh, we, can, we can take some questions, right? I mean, we can go back. I mean, I would like, I, I spoke longer than I wanted to. I would really rather have a conversation. I mean, one of my objectives in life is to eliminate broadcast media. <laughs> you know, here I am being one. I don't. No sé si hay alguna pregunta o alguna, alguien quiere lanzar algo. Great, uh, um, great speech, Mr. Barlow. And that's I, what uh, I try to be for my little children, a better ancestor too. <laughs> um, my question uh, is, uh, now there is the Occupy Wall Street movement, Occupy uh, San Francisco, Occupy 
Um, what are your, your personal feeling about what's happening in the USA? Is it similar to what's happening, uh, what happened in the Arab countries, uh, in, in here in Spain, in Europe? Uh, or there is mm, cultural differences between uh, the, the movement? Is there an, a different focus in the, the United States? How do, how do you see the movement there? It's, the, I mean, it, it, I think it's obviously somewhat different in the Arab awakening because, you know, there you were dealing in many cases with governments that simply had to be overthrown. You know, I mean, there, it wasn't like you could, you could revise the government enough to make it tolerable. And suddenly, because of the internet, there were enough people who who became aware of one another, that they knew that they could get together and do that. It wasn't going to be easy, but they could do it. And they are doing it. I mean, I don't know how things are going to play out in Syria, but I'm, you know, I wouldn't want to be in charge of Syria at the moment. In the United States, and I think in Spain, it's different. We all know what's wrong. I mean, in fact, everybody, I think, knows what's wrong, including the people who were part of the problem. I mean, I rode in an airplane coming over here. I rode across with a very civilized French guy who'd been part of the, the revolution in Paris, which I was part of in 1968, but had after that gone to work for a corporation and was now on the board of directors of a very large pharmaceutical company and was very successful. And I, I said that I felt like what had developed was a cancer on the economy. It wasn't the old dinosaurs anymore. It was a new species that had been enabled by the fluidity of flow financially that was created by globalization and the internet that can without any regulation at all naturally breed monopoly and massive concentration in a short period of time and I said I thought that it was like a cancer and he said I agree but suppose you're a cancer cell How do you stop the tumor? And he really wanted to know. And I couldn't give him an answer. But I know that there are things that we can probably do. In the United States, I'm more familiar with them. But there are things that can be done to regulate the financial industry that were done before. There are things that we have learned over the, the mistakes of the last 30 or 40 years that, that we should be able to profit by. But they may have to be done on a very granular level because the system at the top is too broken to fix itself. So the real challenge is that we take the systems that have made it possible for us to gather so quickly and well and start figuring out ways to get the things done that government used to be able to do and can't do anymore very well. And we figure out ways to, re to regulate the financial bodies that we're presently dependent on. We need to come up with other currency systems. Many of us are working on that, people in this room. We need to come up with with a lot of tools that I think are being assembled by the likes of you. But, other, you know, they're the same movement. It's the party of the future trying to protect itself from the party of the past. Bueno, son las tres o casi las tres un poco más, pero lo vamos a estirar todavía un poquito. Ah, bueno, no he dicho nada antes, pero tenemos una fila cero eh, expandida y descentralizada en el que están 
eh, Estefan, eh, Grueso, Jeremy, Geraldine, José Luis de Vicente, gente de la directa, del periódico Diagonal, John Postil, o sea, es una fila cero así de looks y creo que uno de ellos, ¿no? José Luis me ha pedido. Hi, John. We're so close at this. <laughs> it's like an intimate conversation, <laughs> amplified intimate conversation. Hi. Anyway, hi. Uh, after these two days, I have like one specific concern, and it's something that's been worrying me a while, which is that everybody in this room agrees on lots of stuff, like lots of it. I mean, and everybody in this room has been agreeing on this stuff at least for five to ten years, in a way. And we've been producing a lot of thought and a lot of uh, uh, work on some very specific goals, uh, which were required, and it was important that we had that. But sometimes, like, I'm concerned that, that we are just only seeing, like, specifically in a moment like now, one part of the map and not the whole landscape, and not sort of changing some of the focus from some of the energies uh, to other spaces. Like, for instance, we've been specifically talking a lot about governments. We're just talking about international body, regulatory bodies and legislation, but if you would look at the state of the internet now and some of the agents that are shaping it, they're not coming from governments, they're not coming from legislation, they're coming from Silicon Valley, from the internet culture itself. I mean, many of the goals that they were uh, uh, trying to achieve through the 80s and 90s uh, are already here. And if you look at the, internet of the, at the state of the internet now, I would say that it's hard to say there is any government regulatory body or that has a more direct influence than and, and, and it's a bigger player and has more power in terms of shaping the state of the net for everybody than Google, Amazon, Apple, uh, Facebook. And in a way, those four players define what the internet is for many, many people and all over the world. I wouldn't even count on Facebook for very long. Well, that, that, that's another thing. It's like in the worst, there's going to be someone who's going to be missing. <laughs> and, I'm, yeah. and I'm a little concerned about Apple, you know. Well, <laughs> it's about, but let, let's imagine. I, actually, that's sort of the discourse now that says, next no, 10 years is going to be the internet wars. And we have these four agents, and probably, or almost sure, none of them are going to make it. Uh, and if you look at what is going where, for instance, now the publishing industry is going to be because of all their faults, of all their mistakes, of everything they did, they did wrong, completely pushed aside by this giant that is Amazon that suddenly says, you know what? We don't need a publishing industry because we can be every intermediate that a writer needs to find its audience. And I would like to think that we should start taking some of this energy and put it over here because we may end up in a place where we had this internet where everybody could innovate, but in the end, those everybody were two people. Well, it, it, right after iTunes was created and it, it was, became obvious that it was going to be a success, uh, I had a conversation with Steve Jobs, and I, I said, you know, I've spent the last 15 years trying to kill the large record companies, you know, only to have you resurrect them as one company. <laughs> Why is that better? And he said, oh, well, but we'll evolve. <laughs> I, I guess he's out there evolving right now. <laughs> I, you no, know, it's, it's, this is, <clears throat> it's difficult, I mean, Google, I, I knew they'd made a mistake when they did this. I knew both of those guys when they still didn't know how they were going to make any money from Google. I mean, I, I, they, I saw Google as a search engine when it was still in alpha. And I said, God, you know, this is amazing. This is the holy grail. How are you going to make money from this? And, and one of them said, we don't know, but we're pretty smart. We'll probably figure something out. And they were, you know, and they were not particularly financially motivated and, you know, they set up this notion of don't be evil. They do evil every day now <laughs> and don't even know it. I mean, that w one of the dangers of a slogan like that is that you can be very evil and say, well, I can't be evil. I don't do evil. <laughs> but you're right, you know. You know, for example, when WikiLeaks came down, one of the terrifying realizations was it wasn't the United States government that was the problem. It was Amazon. It was Amazon, and then it was PayPal, and then it was Visa, and then it was MasterCard. And you couldn't tell them that they had to do something. They're private businesses. You don't have any due process. 
to the extent that you might have any rights, you signed them all away when you clicked at the bottom of 47 pages of unreadable prose that you didn't look ever at and, and nevertheless agreed to because otherwise you couldn't start your machine. So, no, it's, it's very problematic. Uh, you know, and it, it, it requires... It requires you to continually hack open the things that they will try to close on their own best interests. You know, even though I've had a long and, and friendly relationship with Apple, I mean, EFF has ha had to sue Apple repeatedly and most, and most recently over the jailbreaking the iPhone, which they were claiming was a criminal act that ought to be heavily prosecuted and we, we showed that it wasn't in court. So the courts are only going to be good for some places. What you really got to do is come up with, a, with technical solutions that make it obvious that what they're trying to do is impractical. You've got to hack them open every time they try to close something. I know that you'll do that. <laughs> and, and don't worry about being the choir. Don't worry about being a small group of people that keep having a conversation with one another. You need that encouragement. And you need the technological understanding. You know, I mean, you also need to get out of the basement. You know, and, you know, I'm a big fan of, of discourse with people that don't have good math skills. Because I'm one of them. So, you know. There has to, you have to, you have to, you have to have a life, but I mean, you also, I wouldn't feel bad about the fact that you've got this, this little group that is very tight. It needs to be. ¿Alguna aportación más? De la fila. Ah. Si, si haces la pregunta en castellano, dice Simona que os va a traducir. Uh, I can do it in both languages. Uh, thank you for your speech. I learned a lot about your history. And now, what are you debugging on? I mean, what are you focusing your time in? Well, <laughs> you know, I like to do something completely different every so often. I mean, I still obviously care about the issues that we're talking about here, and and I take a very active role in in the Electronic Frontier Foundation and. I go around and I talk about these things to people and, and, and want to. But a couple of years ago, I had, a, I, I had been crippled by a spinal degeneration. And I was in a wheelchair. And I was, I was in pain all the time. And I, didn't, I, I quit thinking about the future. And I just... I just thought about getting through the next five minutes. And suddenly, you know, I had an operation which was very dangerous, but I mean, they, they fixed it. And I realized that I had a, you know, if I were like most of the people in my family, I'd live another 30 or 40 years. And I had a huge future. And I thought, well, do I want to go on doing what I've been doing for the last 20 years? Or do I want to go off and try to solve another problem? Because, I mean, there was a time, I mean, 25 years ago, where, you know, I felt like the Internet was one of those things that needed, you know, didn't have very many advocates. I was one of the few people that saw how important it was. Well, now I, I see the real problem of the human race is that we keep throwing stuff away and making things worse for the whole planet that we need to be recycling into ourselves, into the system. So I spent the last three years working with some other folks to design a system that takes carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and recombines it into fuel that's made out of sewage and takes the water that's in the sewage and brings that back on shore so that it can be used. And we're just signing a deal with a big Japanese industrial company next week in New York to build a pilot plant to do that. But you know, it's, I'm, I've become an industrialist in my old age. <laughs> Having avoided the industrial period all along, 
you know, went directly from agriculture to information, thinking that the industrial period was the worst thing that ever happened to humanity, I recognize that if there's going to be fuel and energy, it's going to take an industrial process to do it. And I would rather be part of that industrial process than have the old industrialists do it. So that's what I'm doing now. Completely different. Thanks for the great speech. Um, I was wondering, as someone who's watched this movement grow from a very early stage, literally from its beginnings, do you think that it's now at a stage where it's growing fast enough to combat all the challenges that we're seeing with things like ACTA and legislation that's popping up all over the world to try and control and limit the internet? You know, the funny thing is that as long as I've been engaged in this, it's always felt like a dead heat. It's always felt like, you know, we were right there neck and neck between the forces of liberation and the forces of control. And in fact, you know, if you think about the internet itself, it is a very liberating thing, but there's never been a better surveillance system devised yet. You know, as liberating as it can be, it's also, you know, a marvelous system for imposing very rigid controls. And you can imagine that, you know, the people that, it basically comes down to the people that have faith and the people that have fear. Those are the real two parties in the world. The people that bet on the future and the people that have to be dragged kicking and screaming from the past. And, um, you know, I, I think you'll have plenty of, of good competition all your lives. I've certainly... <laughs> I've had plenty. It's great. I, I don't think I don't think that there's the likelihood that either side is going to is going to gain the upper hand anytime soon. Unfortunately. Or fortunately. Alguna aportación más, una preguntita? Caras de hambre y de emoción, sin duda. El hambre y la emoción, ¿no? <ríe> en esta... En la fila cero, en la fila menos uno. Por favor. Uno de ustedes Yeah, we're now at this stage where they're trying to control the internet. And I would like you to tell us in just one sentence, one thing I could tell to my mother, to the president of our government, and to Bill Gates, on why it's important to keep this internet free. What could I tell all of them at once? Give us some kind of slogan or something to work with. <laughs> Either you know why it's important to be free or you don't. So we have to, so we have to change of president and of not of mother, but we have to change all <laughs> well, of them. I'm, you're probably going to change your president for the worse. With any luck at all, your mother is getting better. Y muchas gracias, John. Good luck. <laughs>